I'm Stephen Buller, I'm Head of Pupillage at 2 Bedford Row. Um, Alice McCoyne um, is our most junior tenant from 2 Bedford Row, so I've asked her to come along uh, this afternoon to maybe give you um, some insight I into what the procedures are for obtaining pupillage, what's it, what it's like, and what it's like being a junior uh, tenant at the bar. Uh, we've got Robert McPeak uh, from the City Law School, who's going to give you some advice as to how to pick up um, advocacy experience, which is vital, obviously, I I in your applications and your uh, future careers. And then last but not least is Tom Wainwright, um, who is a practitioner at Garden Court, um, and so Edward Rowe, somebody from City Law, uh, and then you've got two Garden Courts. Tom will give you a slightly different perspective from a different chambers with a different different ethos and Garden Court have quite a strong ethos as some of you, some of you will know um, and so lots of his experiences will be slightly different again for example to mine and, and analysis so you get the benefits of all, all of those. Uh, we've been asked to tell you roughly what we do so you know uh, the type of work that we do. I do criminal defence work, um, my clients have included the Glasgow Bomber um, the Saudi prince that killed his slave, uh, one of the 21st July bombers, etc., etc. So, uh, fairly sort of heavy terrorism, murder, drug type cases. Um, the others will will tell you what type of work uh, that they do. The purpose of this talk is obviously to give you some idea um, as to what you need to do uh, to get yourself not just a pupillage, but into tenancy, um, hopefully at a criminal set and, and to work as criminal barristers. That's what, you know, the magic questions that you'll be asking. I get asked two questions mainly, so I'm going to answer them for you. The first is, well, how do I get a pupillage in the first place? Um, now, first of all, you know that you have to make written applications, and um, I'm one of the people at Two Bedford Road that go through the written applications, and we have to decide then who we interview. Now we have a two-stage process. We interview about 80 or 90 people first time round in very short interviews and then roughly 20 people in a longer second round interview. We don't have a set number, it's just if we think you're good enough and worth a look then we'll put you on the list. Um, to be perfectly frank, in terms of the written applications it's very difficult to give advice. Um, you should be brief and concise. Uh, you must, as all advocates, assess your audience. You're not making a written application, for example, to somebody who's being paid to go through every single page of all of your wonderful achievements. There's going to be a busy practitioner that is given um, a watch of applications by me, maybe 200 of them, and say, can you please give me a list of the best people in that bundle? Um, by next Wednesday and a groan goes up and it's another piece of work that they have to do. Um, and we expect a certain amount of, of academic uh, standards. We, we, we expect you to be bright and enthusiastic. Um, so there's not really much point in telling us that. We, we usually look for something um, a little bit more. Uh, a commitment, for example, to crime um, is certainly an important thing. If you've done 12 mini pupillages at shipping sets, and then you write in your box, I've always been committed to crime and that's the only thing I've ever wanted to do. We will suspect something is up. Um, if you say that Two Bedford Row is the only chambers in the world for you and you've never wanted to practice anywhere else, and you've not even applied for many people in Two Bedford Row, again, I might raise an eyebrow and think, well, is that really right? Um, and because you have to fill out the uh, form on the old pass system or gateway system, whatever they call it now, it's the same thing, basically. Um, do remember to cut and paste correctly because we always every year get somebody saying to me as head of pupilage of two bedford row i have always wanted to practice at six kbw and uh, is, there is nowhere else i want to go so just make sure you check your form correctly in terms of the form i can't give you much advice it's difficult to stand out from the crowd on paper what i can give you i hope some good advice on is if you get interviews um, and I can talk from our part, and Tom will obviously talk from Garden Court's point of view. But from our part, I conduct all of the interviews um, at Two Bedford Row with a panel of other people. And there is only one thing that you need to be able to do, and that's to be able to stand up in front of us and deliver advocacy. That's it. I get asked over and over again, do I need to have gone to Oxford and Cambridge? What about my A-level results? Uh, what about this? What about that? I, law wasn't my first degree. 
None of that makes any difference. As I say, we will expect you, you won't have got into the room without some academic background behind you. We take that as a given. It, it, it's not what's going to get you a pupillage, it's just what gets you in the room. After that, it's delivering advocacy. The easiest way for me to explain it to you is really like the X factor. Uh, when you watch somebody walk onto the stage and you don't know what they're going to do, what they're going to say, and believe me, we get all different shapes and sizes and people from all different backgrounds walk in and we sit there as a panel and we look at them walking in, they're obviously nervous, we appreciate that they're nervous, it's an interview and who wouldn't be, and we look at them and we have no idea what they're going to be like in an interview, and then they start to talk. And it is literally like the X Factor. Sometimes it's laughable, sometimes it's cringeworthy. But every now and again, somebody will stand there and deliver advocacy. And within 15 seconds, we'll be looking up and down the panel, and it's like sometimes we nudge each other under the desk. Like, this is one that's going to get pupillage in our chambers. And when they leave the room, we often just look at each other like that and we go, yeah, that's a definite, and we just give them a tick. And that's it, they're in. It's as simple and yet as difficult uh, as that. Now, I know Robert's going to tell you, and um, we'll give you some advice as to how it is you get some advocacy experience, and that's really what you will need. Forget everything else. Um, forget worrying, uh, certainly as far as our chambers is concerned, and I hope in respect of all chambers, but certainly in respect of our chambers, and I can tell you this as a fact because I run it, um, we really do not care where you are from. We don't care if you are older or straight through. Uh, we won't, for example, not take you if you're really posh and you went to Oxford. Again, there's no prejudice the other way either. Um, <laughs> in fact, Alice is, was my pupil last year, uh, she is relatively posh and she did go to Oxford, but she uh, was not, uh, I, I wouldn't not give her a pupilage because of that. Um, our pupils this year, we have two mature um, pupils, uh, both on second careers, one a working mother um, doing pupilage, <laughs> God help her, difficult time, and uh, somebody that was in the army and is now a pupil with us, and then a young man that's come straight through uh, from university. Until today, I didn't know what universities they had gone to until I got into a discussion with one of you, maybe even here on the stand, saying to me, oh, but you must only take people from Oxford and Cambridge. And I said, we truly, really don't. And to prove it, I'm going to ask the people on the stand what university they went to, and they were our current pupils. Now, the point there, I didn't know what they were going to say. I genuinely didn't know what universities they'd gone to. So if they said oh, all of them Oxford and Cambridge, it would have been difficult. But I didn't actually know what universities they'd gone to. And we have, uh, as it turns out, somebody from an open university and the man in the army did distance learning. And then the other one went to Nottingham University. So uh, that's proof of the pudding. The main proof, in fact, is that I didn't know uh, where they'd gone because it's not relevant to us. It's whether you walk into the room and whether you deliver. Second question we always get asked now is, well, is the criminal bar dead? Nobody's making any money. It, should we go off and be bankers? Well, uh, you can go off and become a banker. You can even go off and become a civil barrister. You can even go off and become a solicitor. Uh, but in 10 years' time at dinner parties, nobody's going to be interested in what you did at work uh, the week before. <laughs> so if you're going to be the person that is skipped, it's like, oh, you're, you're, you're working for Barclays Bank in Futures. Great. Yeah, but what do you do? Oh, you're a criminal barrister. That's interesting. What have you done? It's a much more interesting uh, way of life. Um, I didn't come into it straight away. I was in my mid-twenties. I had been a chef and a painter and decorator and a gardener and lots of things beforehand. Went to the City of London Polytechnic and then qualified, uh, got the worst pupillage in the world, in the worst chambers in the world, uh, but with probably one of the best pupil masters in the world. So I was very fortunate in one way. There was one thing that worked in my favour. I had a fantastic pupil master who taught me the ropes and then I sort of crawled my way uh, slowly up uh, to Two Bedford Row. And it was the best decision I ever made. Now, in terms of fees, uh, you um, financially have lost nothing, as far as I'm aware. Uh, none of you have billed criminal legal aid cases in the last 12 months, is that right? Right, so 
if they were to reduce them by 15% tomorrow, how much money have you lost? Well, you've lost nothing because you never owned it in the first place. In, in, in fact, the cut in legal aid it is difficult for people uh, that are more senior because they have maybe suffered a drop in income. And anybody that suffers a, suffers a drop in income, um, it makes it difficult for them because people cut their cloth according to their income. You've lost nothing. There is still a good living uh, to be made um, in um, even criminal legal aid work. I know Tom and I discussed this last year as to how best explain, uh, to explain the position to you. We both earn more than the Prime Minister um, in this country. Um, and maybe by a significant margin. Um, so, oh, woe is us. We didn't, we're not earning many, many hundreds of thousands like people used to, um, but we're still not doing badly, and I wouldn't change it uh, for the world. Um, if you want to do it, you must be committed. There is no place any longer uh, for the lazy gentleman barrister that would just turn up, make a good living by not being committed. It used to happen. Uh, my senior clerk used to, said to me that 10 or 15 years ago, he could basically be produced with anybody. Any, any person at all could come into chambers and he'd be able to produce for them um, a good living, a good standard of living, just by the fact they were in two Bedford Row. That doesn't happen anymore, and quite rightly so. It, it should be uh, competitive. I'll finish now. I'm not sure if I'm on my five or seven minutes. Probably not. Um, with just one thing about the future uh, of the bar, I think there will always be an independent bar. Uh, because demand always um, affects supply. If you walk out into the marketplace, people want to speak to barristers about the advice that they uh, are, are asking for. If you are arrested uh, and you are a man of good character uh, and you are charged with a crime that might take you away from your children and your business, um, then believe me, you want to speak to an expert. You may not want to speak to a solicitor advocate who doesn't really know um, his ass from his elbow. Um, I'm not sure if that gets bleeped, it might do. Um, I read a book, and this is well finished, I read a book, it was given to me by a friend of mine who's a civil barrister, and it's the 100 greatest closing speeches um, in criminal cases ever. And I flicked through immediately, and none of mine were in there, but <laughs> then I realized why it was an American book. And it was all um, uh, written by an American attorney. And in the foreword, it's very interesting foreword, I was reading it, and the book was written some time ago, um, maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, he said of his own system, the American system, one thing that we haven't learned, he said, is what the um, English learned many, many years ago, many hundreds of years ago, by having a split profession, that if you want a specialist advocate to walk into court and present a case, you have to have a split system. And that's what he was saying to Americans, saying this is where we've got it wrong, just having attorneys at law doing it all together. And sadly, it seems as though the government, at least, and some solicitors have forgotten the lesson we learned a long time ago, but the public won't. Because if you were in trouble, um, you could have a solicitor represent you or a barrister, and, and, and you know, um, all of you, which one you would choose uh, one over the other. If you want to get somebody to paint your wall, you don't go to a carpenter, you, you go to a painter, you ask somebody that's a specialist I I in that job. And so I'm going to hand you over to a junior specialist, our newest specialist in that job, and that's Miss Bacoin. Hi everyone, as you've heard, my name's Alice and I've been a tenant at Two Bedford Row since September, and before that I did my 12 month pupillage um, at Two Bedford Row with Stephen as my pupil master. So I've been through the process pupil that you're... Pupil supervisor. Oh, pupil supervisor, I think is the new PC way of calling it. Um, I've been through the process that you're all embarking on relatively recently, and so what I'm going to talk to you today about is really my own experience of the application process and of pupillage itself. Um, and of course, that is just my personal experience, so it might n not all of it will have general application. But I do hope that it will be able to, um, I'll be able to give you some advice along the way. I read English at university, and I only decided in the summer between my second and third year that I wanted to go into law um, after having spent a week up in Bolton Crown Court with a judge who was a friend of the family. So by that stage, I was um, headlong into finals, and I really didn't have enough time, in my view, to do all the, uh, get all the experience and do all the sort of investigation that I wanted to do before I could commit to what I knew was a long and expensive further training program. So. Partly for that reason and partly for other reasons, I took a year out, and during that year, 
I spent in total 15 weeks in court on mini pupillages, um, shadowing circuit judges and marshalling with high court judges. Now there is absolutely no need to do anything like that and in hindsight probably it was a bit of an overkill. But I will say that it had four main advantages for me. And the first was that before I decided to become a barrister, I wanted, or I thought I wanted to become a broadcast journalist. And it took eight weeks of work experience in the media before I realised that actually wasn't for me. So I realised that you do actually have to put quite a lot of time into experiencing a career before you can make an informed decision as to whether it is for you. Second advantage is that as much as I was fairly sure that I wanted to become a criminal barrister rather than any other form of barrister, that was based on absolutely no experience whatsoever. So I made sure that I did a couple of mini pupillages at civil sets and one at a family set as well as at criminal sets. And that had the advantage of not only confirming for myself that that's what I wanted to do. When I was asked an interview, I could actually give a reasoned answer rather than just saying something that was theoretical. So uh, as well as that, obviously, you know that it's very competitive. Mini pupillages show commitment. Mini pupillage at the set that you want to go to shows commitment. And I think above everything else, mini pupillages give you something to talk about in an interview because you will be asked questions like, uh, why do you want to become a barrister? Why a criminal barrister? Um, what cases have you seen that interest you? What styles of advocacy have you seen? And you have to have been to court um, to experience that and to be able to answer those questions. So in terms of the stages that I went through, obviously uh, it was then a question of applying for the GDL and applying for GDL scholarships. Very few people realise that the Inns of Court do offer scholarships for your law conversion year. That's if you're doing it that route rather than doing a straight law degree. But it's certainly worth applying for them. Um, they do help a lot. It's not as expensive as the BPTC, but it's still an expensive year. So certainly do apply. And I think that's in sort of Easter time of the year before you begin your GDL. And then when you're on your GDL, I gather you're going to be spoken to about all the different opportunities there are. There certainly are a lot, and it's worth doing as many as possible. I know there was the free representation unit when I was um, at City Law School, um, women's crisis groups, citizens' advice, other forms of pro bono units that you could join. And obviously it shows commitment, but it also gives you some experience and, again, something to talk about in interviews. And then obviously mooting, although the only thing I did was to take part in a mooting competition in which I got knocked out in the first round, so it didn't really help me. Uh, what I did instead was um, I volunteered with the Prisoners Advice and Care Trust, as it then was, I think it's been renamed now, um, which involved working at Wormwood Scrubs Prison every Wednesday afternoon for six months. Um, the reason I did it was partly because, for me, and I think actually a lot of people, prison is something that I obviously wasn't familiar with, and it held a certain horror for me, and I realised that was something I had to get over before I embarked on uh, a career at the criminal bar. But also, I was aware that one of my main stumbling blocks would always be the fact that I tend to come across as um, a sort of wide-eyed innocent who stepped out of the Edwardian era, and that doesn't necessarily go down very well. So I knew that if I could show that I'm perfectly capable of dealing with the realities of the criminal bar, then that would help. And it did help in interviews, and I was able to talk about it. Um, on to Old Pass. My main piece of advice would be, I think it's open for a month. Um, use all that time. The number of people I know who started filling in their form at three in the morning on the day of the deadline, and that's absolute madness. It's one of those forms where, probably deliberately, the questions are relatively similar, and it takes a while to work out how you're going to put the substance that you want to put into the form, how you're going to allocate that between the questions without re repeating yourself, and really work out what it is they're asking you. And that takes time, and it takes thought, so start early. It's also a perfect opportunity, much like the personal statement in the UCAS form, to make a complete idiot out of yourself when you're writing about yourself. And so the, the main thing you want to do is to be able to write your first draft, put it aside for a week, come back to it, think, oh my God, delete it all and start again. But if you just end up writing that on the day of the deadline, you don't have that opportunity. Uh, the last thing on that front is don't put in jokes. I know some of my friends thought that it would make them stand out from the crowd. It didn't go down well. So I, I really wouldn't recommend that. Um, then, at the same time as Old Pass, there are BPTC scholarship interviews at the Inns of Court. Again, definitely apply for those. They really, really help uh, with funding for the BPTC year. Uh, I would say don't expect to be able to walk into those interviews without preparation. They're relatively tough. They, the panels expect you to be up on the law. They expect you to have all the answers that you're going to have to give a couple of months later in pupillage interviews anyway. So I'd put some time into that, that interview, into preparing for it. And then pupillage interviews themselves, they are gruelling. There's, there's really no two ways about it. You 
have, as you've heard, you do your old pass form, then a certain number of selected for first round interview, and then out of that, a certain number for second round interview. In almost every single interview, you will have some form of advocacy exercise, and most of the time, you're given that 15 minutes in advance. It will normally be either a bail application or a plea and mitigation, so it's really worth, even if you haven't done the BPTC yet, so you don't, haven't been taught the, the structure of it, it's worth speaking to a criminal practitioner or trying to see one in court or even going to the library and having a look at practitioner. Um, there are some sort of easy-to-use um, advocacy in the magistrate's gu um, guide books, effectively. Just know what the basic structure is because that's what you need when you're panicking in the 15 minutes where you've just been given the papers and you're just about to go in front of a panel. Uh, again, be up to speed on current issues in law. The panels want to see that you're interested enough that you're following the news and reading into it. So do try and stay up to date. Have, have a view, if you can, on things that are relevant to criminal law. Um, that said, I had an interview in a week where I'd had, I think, four GDL exams and then interviews every evening. And I had this interview on the Saturday morning. It was the week when the Savile report came out to do with the Bloody Sunday inquiry. And I didn't even know that. I had no idea. And my first question when I went into this interview was for my view on this. And so my first answer was a vague attempt to blag. And then I was pressed on it. And I had to say, I'm really sorry. I, I haven't kept up with this. Left the interview in floods of tears, thought that was it, and ended up getting a second round interview there and then met one of the people from the panel in Wormwood Scrubs prison, actually, the following Wednesday and said, I'm just so mortified by that. That was just hideous. And he said, no, actually, you know, it's better. If you really don't know, it's better that you say it's similar to being in court. You can't bullshit these people. They can tell. And so it's much better just to say, I'm sorry, I don't know. Obviously, it's better if you do know the answer, but it, you can't be up to date with everything. Um, the usual questions you'll get, I think I mentioned them earlier. Why do you want to be a barrister? Why a criminal barrister? Um, have ready answers, because it's quite easy to go in and actually have forgotten to prepare for those sort of questions. Um, don't be thrown off by people in the interview rolling their eyes or looking bored. I discovered quite far into the process that that's a tactic that's used to see if you're going to freak out. It took me a while. And it's just really, also if you have somebody who really presses you, it's to make sure that when you first get in front of a judge who's grumpy or who just thinks that everything you're saying is rubbish, that you're not going to panic and burst into tears. So just be aware of it. It's a tactic and just press on. Um, so in terms of uh, me and the stages, I was lucky enough to get pupillage that year. A lot of my friends who are absolutely brilliant didn't, and they applied the next year and they've got pupillage now. So I know it's easy for me to say, but it's a numbers game. There are simply too many people, so don't lose heart if you don't get it the first year. Apply again the next year. In terms of pupillage itself, um, criminal pupillages are a bit different from other pupillages in the sense that the first and six, the first six and second six are very different. First six, you spend every day with your pupil master in court. Uh, it's a great opportunity to see cases that you won't be able to, uh, well, that are far above your own level for many years. Uh, you meet other barristers, you see how it's all done, you can talk to your pupil master or pupil supervisor about the tactics behind what he's doing, um, the advocacy that you're seeing. It's a wonderful opportunity to learn an awful lot. In the second six, you're completely on your own. You're in the magistrate's court every single day, um, all over the country, several cases a day sometimes, and it's just a total change. It's, it's like life at the bar, but there's no sort of overlap. I know it's some, in some other um, areas of law, there's not that much of a transition and you don't go to court for ma ma many months sometimes. In the criminal bar, it's Friday, you're with your pupil master, the next Monday, you're completely on your own. Um, at Two Bedford Road, there's a lot of emphasis put on written work that you do for other members of chambers, and that's partly so that you learn different aspects of the law. But it's also an opportunity for you to impress members of chambers who at the end of the year are going to be the ones that you're asking for references um, for tenancy. So it's for that reason that uh, pupillage is absolutely exhausting because it's effectively two working days in one. You have your day, whether it's with your pupil master or doing your own cases, you come back to chambers and you've got to embark on written work for members of chambers. And that's why you work till the wee hours every single day and every weekend for the entire year. And it is absolutely exhausting. There is no way of doing pupillage or doing pupillage well without putting in those hours. And you just have to accept that that pupillage will be a year of nothing but work. Um, it's, it's an unfortunate part of it. But in terms of the written work that you do for other members of chambers, it's actually 
a great opportunity, again, to do work that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do for years and years. At Two Bedford Row, I was really lucky because I did work for members of chambers who have all sorts of niche practices alongside their criminal practices, um, such as health and safety law, extradition, um, sports law, all sorts of different things. And it, was, it really was a, a great opportunity and really interesting. And it's actually work that I now miss because I don't get to do it. Um, so just to finish, because I think I've gone over by quite a long way, um, it is, it's a hellish year in some respects. It's like a 12-month long interview where you're being judged all the time. Uh, you're constantly exhausted and everything's new and nerve-wracking. But it's also so much fun. Every time you're in court, it's fun. When you're off on your own little independent adventures in magistrates court all over the country, you're meeting new people, it's great fun. When you come back to chambers and you're with articulate, interesting people, it's a wonderful atmosphere to be in. And all I can say is it is worth all the hard work. And I wish you all the very best of luck. Um, I really hope it goes well for all of you. Right. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Rob McPeak, I'm from City Law School uh, and I'm also delighted to find out from Stephen's introduction that I'm not the only City Poly alumnus uh, in the room, which is fantastic, there are so few of us these days. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about something that's already been spoken about by our two previous speakers, which is the advocacy uh, side of things. And I'm afraid that because I'm a, a lecturer at City Law School, the innate teacher in me uh, has to burst out from time to time, so I've done a handout. Um, <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I'm afraid there's only about 20, so it might have to be one between two or even three uh, for you. But um, I really did it because I wanted to make the point that um, we've heard about the significance of advocacy. Uh, both in terms of kind of preparing yourself, preparing mentally, um, making sure that you're ready for your pupillage interviews, uh, the sort of tasks that uh, you'll be asked or may be asked to perform uh, during those interviews. And I think what I wanted to say really was just to kind of emphasise that um, it kind of surprises me um, how often I encounter uh, people who appear to want to uh, practice at the bar and yet have spent very, very little time indeed actually putting themselves in that environment. Okay? Now, I, I entirely take Alice's point that you don't want to go overboard in terms of things like mini pupillages, uh, because I, you know, I think up to about I don't know, five or six, it sounds like you're kind of doing some, some sensible research, maybe doing a couple of civil minis just to see what life is like on the other side of uh, the fence, uh, but you get up to 10 or 12 and it sounds like you've become a bit OCD uh, on, on just doing mini pupillages. But what I would say is, you don't need to go to court with a pupil supervisor on a mini pupillage. Um, you know, courts are public buildings, they're open to all of us. You can go and take yourself off to the, uh, the local Crown Court, the local Mags Court, sit in the public gallery and just do some observation. Okay, now you may say, well, that's not as good as a mini, is it? Because I won't have access to the case papers. Okay, I won't really understand necessarily what the, the barristers are talking about. What I would say is, actually, in a lot of mags courts, of course, you've got justice of the peace. Okay, they won't have case papers, or many case papers. They might have charge sheet uh, to hand. If you go off to the Crown Court, what do the jury have at the start? They might have a copy of the indictment between every pair uh, of them. That might be it. There may be exhibits that come along from time to time. Uh, that's true. But in essence, uh, the fact finders in court start with a blank page, a clean slate. So if you went and took yourself off to your local criminal court, mags or crown court, and sat in the public gallery there, you'd be put in essentially the same position as most of the fact finders that we ever encounter in criminal practice. Okay? And it is the job, it is the function of the barristers in that particular proceeding yeah, to be persuasive, to educate in part, to inform, to persuade the people who started off this case knowing next to nothing about it. So you're in exactly the same position as those fact finders are, which I think actually puts you in the ideal position to begin to reflect on the job that the barristers in that case are actually doing. Because if they haven't informed you with the sort of interest and background uh, that you've got, then they're probably not informing the fact finders either. Okay? So um, I would want to encourage you then to actually take yourself off uh, to spend time in court. Just, you know, see what's going on there. Okay? Um, in particular, I think Alice has already mentioned the fairly kind of standard criminal tasks or advocacy tasks that you might well be asked to do, bail application. Okay. Bail applications, uh, you can probably go and see quite a lot of those uh, in the magistrate's courts. 
sometimes they burst into the uh, the Crown Court, and there's you know interesting ones uh, going on there. I think uh, there may be one coming up in the next. A uh, few days on behalf of Mr. Abu Qatada. Um, so there may be a renewed application for bail there. Uh, we missed probably the most exciting um, application for bail uh, from last year, which was, of course, made on behalf of Mr. Julian Assange. Um, should he ever remove himself from the Ecuadorian embassy, <laughs> then I would be fascinated to hear the renewed application for bail that may be made on, on his behalf. Um, but there are, should we say, less high-profile bail applications being made on a pretty much daily basis. Uh, in, certainly in the magistrates' courts. Yeah? And it would be a great idea to certainly, as Alice has suggested, acquaint yourself with the legal framework. You can have a look at the legal framework in the Bail Act uh, 1976 before you go along uh, to the Mags Court, just to kind of get an idea of the basic tests, the questions, the legal questions that the court is being asked to, uh, to consider before releasing anybody on bail. But I think what I'd suggest in terms of the handout that hopefully is somewhere out there now, um, You've got uh, advocacy performance criteria uh, there, and the first set of criteria that you've got relate to watching submissions and applications, like a bail application. So, for example, it will say there that one of the things that you ought to be doing in terms of a submission or application to the court is to prepare the case effectively, understanding the relevant law, the material facts, the objections from the other side. So there has to be good, effective case preparation. Okay? And, of course, you may say, well, how will I know? I'm sitting in the public gallery. How could I possibly know whether there's been effective case preparation or not? And I guess in the same way that Stephen has already indicated that in the first minute or so, maybe less, uh, you get some sort of sense of whether the individual is up to the job or not, that will happen to you in court as well. You will be able to assess. If they're not putting their case competently and effectively with a sensible structure and organisation to it, it should be obvious to you. Okay? So, you know, good preparation has to be reflected in good presentation and good performance. Otherwise, it wasn't good preparation. Okay? There are other things to think about. Um, submission that's uh, appropriate, relevant, legally and factually sound. And again, that takes you back to thinking about what are the legal tests? What are the legal questions uh, that are going to be applied? Structuring your submission in a clear and logical way, you should be able to follow through as defence uh, barristers deal with each of the objections raised by the prosecution in turn one after the other. Okay. Delivery, really if uh, you can't follow what the barrister is saying because they're, they're too quiet or they're muttering or they're talking to the table instead of actually looking at the court, yeah, that's something else to, to bear in mind. Yeah. Lastly, um, and I think again this comes back to Stephen's point about you can probably tell whether somebody's got it or not at a fairly early stage of them being on their feet, uh, make a submission or an application that's effective and persuasive. Okay. And the best example that I can give to you of that is actually not in the context of bail applications, it's in the context of pleas in mitigation, which I think again was something else that, that Alice mentioned. Pleas in mitigation, a long time ago uh, at City Law School, uh, we used to assess, it used to be our final advocacy assessment, uh, pleas in mitigation. Everybody had to do one. Okay. And they had around about 12 minutes to put out their plea in mitigation, which was recorded. Okay. And the assessors would sit down afterwards and work through the recordings that have been allocated to them. Now, I can say that the cases that we used, most people, most years, managed to do a pretty solid plea in mitigation in around about seven, eight minutes. Okay? They weren't the most complicated cases uh, in the world. Seven, eight minutes would do the job. You know, you'd have heard them talking about the offence, you'd have heard them talking about the offender, you'd have heard them making some sensible recommendations uh, and arguments as to what sentence the court might impose. And that's pretty much it in terms of structure for a plea mitigation. Okay? So they take about seven or eight minutes. The people that were perhaps struggling would maybe still be going 10 minutes, 11 minutes, you're kind of getting a bit worried for them now. Maybe 12 minutes, the buzzer goes, suddenly pff, they've gone. Right? Okay? Now, they might have done enough in that 12 minutes to have got through. Okay? They might have done enough. I say most people, seven, eight minutes, they're good to go. Yeah? And they've done a solid job. Now, there's a, a smaller group, which subdivides into two smaller groups. There's a smaller group who would have taken maybe three, four minutes on their plea mitigation. Okay? And that smaller group say, fell into two distinct camps. There was one camp where the wheels were coming off, 
yeah, in a really bad way. They had no idea what was involved in the plea mitigation. In fact, it didn't even look terribly uh, convincing that they actually knew they were making a plea in mitigation. Okay? And they'd get to about three or four minutes, and then you know, kind of the, the pressure and the shock and the adrenaline rush would just, they'd keel over. And, and that would be that. They'd be dragged out of the room, and they'd have failed the advocacy assessment. Okay? On the other hand, there are a group of people who took about three, four minutes tops to do their plea mitigation, and those were the guys that were really getting to the nub of the matter. Yeah? So seven or eight minutes, you've basically covered everything in the brief. You've gone through all the instructions, you've pulled out the material law, you've pulled out the material facts, you've wrapped it up nicely, offence, offender, sentence, bush. It's done. Okay? But the three to four minute people were the ones that had gone through all of that and then thought again. And they thought, what do I really need to put to the sentencer that is going to really kind of unlock this case? Yeah? What do I have to do to be effective and persuasive? Okay? And if you like, that is a kind of, it's like a kind of star quality uh, type of thing. But one way to actually, I think, begin to convince yourself, and we are our, our own harshest critics, one way you can begin to convince yourself is to spend time in court watching people do these things. Yeah? And if you have those sorts of criteria uh, involved, you will be able to do your own reflection and assessment on how effectively that was working. And I think the, the single biggest advantage of having some advocacy criteria uh, to hand when you go into court and do an observation is that you can then apply those criteria to whatever the task is that you're seeing the barristers actually performing. Okay? It's no good thinking, oh, this is a barrister of, I don't know, five years call, eight years call. I can't even envisage what it would be like to be a barrister of eight years call. Yeah? I mean, I remember when I started in my chambers, uh, barristers of eight years call, it was, it was like, you know, how old were these guys? Why weren't they dead yet? Yeah? So someone of eight years call, you would kind of assume that they would know what they were doing and that everything that they were doing was really to the point. Yeah? But not necessarily the case. And even if it is the case, maybe you could do it better. Maybe you can think of ways to improve. Okay? So having those criteria to hand, going into court, doing those observations, I think is a really good way to prepare yourself for the sorts of challenges that you're going to face when it comes to, to pupillage. I'm probably going to have to, to stop there. I will just point out that I've also put some criteria on there for witness handling, for, uh, examination in chief, and for cross uh, as well, so that if you see somebody being questioned uh, in the witness box, you can begin to think about those sorts of things. The obvious differences between the sets of criteria now when you move on to witness handling, you're looking at things like questioning content, yeah? So what's, what's actually being asked, what topics are being explored, and you're also looking at questioning technique. Yeah? So in chief is your witness, typically you're looking at lots of what we s might say WH type questions. Who, what, when, where, how, those types of things. Okay? In cross, it tends to be more overt control because it's not your witness, they're probably not helpful to you, and there the kind of maxim tends to be tell, don't ask. It's much more about leading and overt leading. Uh, of the witness. You have to get your case across. Give the witness a chance to perhaps address the challenge that you're making uh, to their evidence, but also advertise your case to the fact finders in court. So there are different challenges involved in chief and in cross-examination. Hopefully that comes out through the uh, criteria that I've put uh, on that sheet. So as I say, I I'll shut up and pass over to Tom, but Please do spend time in court and reflect on what you're seeing. It will be invaluable to you. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure we've got too much time left, and I know there'll be lots of questions, um, so I'll keep it um, quite short. Uh, as Stephen said, I'm at Garden Court, which is a uh, left-wing human rights chambers. I do only do crime, uh, but possibly we sort of have a different outlook on matters, and I'll mention some of that. Um, and also I thought I'd just touch on the sort of work that I'm doing uh, at my level of practice and the sort of lifestyle. Um, not just so I'm talking about myself, but you know, it should give you some idea as to whether that is something that interests you, that drives you, um, and whether that lifestyle is something that you can, um, can cope with. And I'll also mention some of the qualities I think that across the board, whether you're at uh, a chambers like ours or anywhere else at the criminal bar, that you will need to survive uh, and that we look for. Um, my background was I always wanted to be a criminal barrister um, from a very early age. I was very lucky to end up at Garden Court 
Uh, I didn't have a pupillage lined up after bar school. I took another couple of years to get a pupillage, uh, in the course of which I went to a total of 46 interviews. Um, I only got the pupillage because someone else dropped out, uh, didn't get tenancy, and then ended up at Garden Court. Um, and it's, uh, as I say, I've been extremely fortunate uh, that I've ended up there. The sort of work I started off doing is the sort of work you will do uh, when you start out in crime, first of all in the magistrate's court, then the odd hearing in the Crown Court, then your first Crown Court trial. Um, and then you keep on, uh, if you're lucky enough, progressing onto more and more serious cases, dealing with the Court of Appeal, um, dealing with uh, longer and longer cases, more serious offences. Um, there's always uh, a new challenge, there's always a uh, point that you have to raise your game um, and, uh, and progress. Um, but all of that is very, very tiring. Um, the applications for pupillage, the interviews for pupillage, the pupillage itself, those first uh, few years or however many years it is when you're sat around in the magistrate's court for hours on end, um, you're working into the night to prepare your first trial. Um, and I think one of the qualities that you need uh, is a thick skin, you need uh, determination um, and you need somehow to be able to draw on huge reserves of energy uh, to be able to do the job. The rewards are there, um, however, I don't mean the financial rewards, I don't think, um, no, whether it's more than the Prime Minister, it is possible to earn a decent living uh, at the criminal bar still, not as much as it was, um, but it is still uh, possible to do that. It's very easy for us to say after um, being in the job for a few years, we realise just how difficult it still is at the very beginning uh, to be able to pay the bills, to pay the rent. Uh, you've, I think I came out of bar school with about £20,000 worth of debt and I, th I imagine it's much, much more now. Um, and when you start off in those early years, uh, you're relying on the solicitors to pay your fees for the magistrate's court, the princely sum of £50 for what's been a whole night's work and the whole day sat around at court um, and the Legal Services Commission funding for Crown Court cases if you're lucky enough to do those. Uh, the cuts that have taken place in recent years seem to be mostly impacting on those at the junior end um, and we do what we can to support um, those uh, who are struggling at the junior end, um, we realise just how difficult it is, but we don't want to lose those best quality candidates um, because of the um, constant cuts that the, uh, the government and the Legal Services Commission are, are imposing. So uh, there is support out there where, where possible. Um, and then once you are through, as I say, to uh, a few more years seniority, um, then it does get easier and there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but when I talk about the rewards, I'm really talking about uh, the job itself. Um, and that's why I think if anyone's going into uh, the criminal law, that's why they're doing it. Um, the uh, last case I did, uh, finished yesterday, um, some of you may have heard of it. It was the student protesters, Alfie Meadows and Zach King. Uh, who were attacked by police in 2010. Uh, both of them struck with batons um, and then charged with violent disorder. Um, and yesterday, after over two years and a four-week trial, uh, the jury unanimously acquitted them both. Barstander's board uh, guidance is currently that I'm not allowed to express my personal view on cases. Um, but I can say that <laughs> not referring to any specific case, there are cases where you think, this is why I'm doing this job. Uh, there is no better feeling um, than getting the right verdict um, and getting that buzz and saying that there are people who can now move on with their lives. Um, there is nothing worse than getting the wrong verdict, on the other hand. Um, there are other cases which aren't going to be as, as exciting, uh, that you aren't going to feel as passionate about necessarily as, as others. Um, and that does make up the majority of the work um, to, to an extent. They're not going to be the, the glamorous high-profile cases. 
Um, so that determination, uh, that thick skin uh, that I mentioned in terms of getting uh, to pupillage, you also need when you're in, in practice uh, as well. Um, and the lifestyle can be draining, it can be tiring, you can uh, be uh, unable to sleep, waking up in the middle of the night thinking I need to put this point in cross-examination tomorrow, I need to make this point in my closing speech, um, working late into the night, getting things at the last minute. Um, and it, it, it does get uh, quite tiring um, and that's something that you need to be able to uh, to do. So that's something that you need to think about before you go down that route. Um, but it's that commitment that you need, the enthusiasm, uh, the determination, um, even if it's not the most exciting case in the world, to still be able to give it 100% uh, of your uh, focus, of your energy. Uh, and of your uh, hard work is incredibly important and that is uh, everything that we do uh, at, at Garden Court is that every case is important to us um, and that same ethos, the commitment to human rights, social justice, uh, the liberty of the individual, uh, the importance of protecting against abuses of the state, uh, those are some of the things, uh, the, perhaps the most important things we look for in our pupils. We also look for advocacy ability, we look for your academic background, we look for the work experience that you've got, um, and it's all of those things go into the mix. If you're weak in one area, you can be very strong in another area. There's no real sort of knockout blows in, in any of that. Um, so if you have got uh, a low degree, uh, then it's, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Um, if you can show that you're, an outs you're outstanding in some of those other areas. Um, and it's those people who have that dedication, that determination and that enthusiasm uh, who I think will uh, be the ones who succeed uh, at the criminal bar and who there will always be uh, a place for uh, in the future. Thank you.